I, uh, in college, I was a hospital chaplain. And when I did that, as you might expect, I experienced a lot of battles with cancer. Um, I came into the room when someone was just diagnosed. Uh, I sat there, prayed, and cried with the family. Um, I was there when the bed was being cleaned after someone lost the battle, or in the case of holy eternity and in heaven, um, won the battle, right? Uh, found Christ. I was there the whole time. Um, I was there in so many different stages and so many different areas of that battle and that fight. And something that my professor, because I was a student hospital chaplain, something that my professor thought was important was that we understand what cancer was at the scientific level uh, to truly feel like we could impact and have authority in these people's lives. So it wasn't just us brushing over this topic and saying, oh, cancer, it's the, it's the bad word, but we, we knew. Um, and so he decided to tell us, well, cancer, and I'll tell you, cancer uh, impacts at a molecular level, at a cellular level. You don't even know that cancer is happening until it metastasizes or until it moves to another area. That's when your symptoms start. And so usually, one cell will attack another cell, one cell will attack another cell, one cell will attack another cell, and set your lung. And that lung is completely useless by the time you start to cough, by the time you start to feel the symptoms. I think our inheritance, my inheritance, is an inheritance of cancer. Because sin is so like that. Sin attacks at a cellular, molecular level, and we don't even know that it's happening until it's metastasized or moved into our attitudes and our actions, right? And it's so important to recognize that, but it's also important to recognize who cures that, right? That's what Andrew talked about. Who is the cure? Jesus Christ. And so I want to tell you, in, in my life, when I recognize this, the cancer of sin, the inheritance, the birthmark that I've had put on my life by the first Adam, I'm going to blame him. That the second Adam came and changed all of that. Okay, the second Adam is the Most High, is the Christ. And this Christ has changed me at a molecular and cellular level. This Christ saved us, saves us. And tomorrow, before we sin, he's saved us again. Right? Okay, so hold on to that. I'm also going to tell you a story about a little girl in India. I went to India. This Christ is the one who called me to India. I didn't want to go talk about fear. Huh. Uh, <laughs> went to India, and uh, I, mean, I experienced so many things. There's so many things that I will never forget. Uh, but one of the things I will never forget is a girl's face who will never be remembered. She was in a village of 200,000 people, which, by the way, is much bigger than my hometown, which is not a small city. Um, 200,000 people in this village is considered completely off the beaten track. Nobody knows where it is. And so we find it after about two and a half hours of searching. We go into a church. In that church, we preach. And you have 13, or I guess 11, college student Americans piling into this church. And after that, thousands of Indians. Thousands upon thousands, upon thousands. They're crawling through the windows, they're sitting on the floor, and I don't know why, and I really appreciate it, but the first people that they allowed to come in after us were the children. And so as we're sitting on the side walls preaching or sitting and listening, you see all of these children just piled in front of us, at least 500. <laughs> and I see this one girl's face, and she's just staring me down. She's not, she's not looking at the preacher. She probably should have been. She's not looking at the preacher. She's not looking at anyone else but me. And then the, the sermon ends, and we all pray, and it all gets charismatic, because apparently that's what we do. And then we leave on the bus, and I don't even know that little girl's name. I will never know that little girl's name. I'll never go back to that village. It doesn't have an address. It doesn't have a name. You see, because we live in a cancerous world, we live in a world where that's allowed. We live in a world where people are forgotten, where people are not given the respect by their landowner, let alone the respect to impact this world as they should. People are not favored here. At least these people. I ask that you stand here and receive the word of the Lord.
The scripture is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this, by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not been intimate with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. The word of God for the people of God. What? That's not how the story goes, right? First of all, we are a cancerous world. Why would a savior want to come here and dwell? Why would he make his tent with us? It's contagious. It's, if, if you're born in the birthright, you receive it, right? And even if, even if he is going to come, why? Why would the Most High, and that's the only thing this passage got right, the Savior is the Most High. Why, why would the Most High come to a nobody 14-year-old girl in a village that nobody cared about? Not, not even her own king cared that she was nine months pregnant traveling across the country. Not even her own king cared, and yet she supposedly is going to become a vital role in the passion play of God. She will be the mother of the Most High. And even, even if she was going to be included in this story, why? Th this is a Savior. This is the Christ, the one that I described. Why would he come as a baby? That doesn't make sense. Okay, but it did happen. Right? It did. We know it. We believe it. We experience it every day. Right? We feel the risen Christ. So why did it happen this way? So let me tell you about the first Adam. The first Adam's inheritance for us is cancer, right? The first Adam didn't come as a baby. The first Adam was a man, and in a whole of three chapters, he destroyed us all, right? Genesis 1 is great. Genesis, well, Genesis 1, he's barely even there. Genesis 2, everything's looking dandy. Genesis 3, the fall, right? Capital F. It took three chapters for him. It took 33 years for Jesus. That doesn't make sense, right? Shouldn't the second Adam be able to fix the first one's fault in that much time or less? But here's the thing. Our, our birthright from Adam was cancer. Our birthright was a chink in our DNA. But our birthright from the second Adam is a relationship. From the second Adam, this Christ, we receive change. We receive one who will stand with us. Because us and the first Adam have something in common. We both mess up, right? We both have sin. We both choose lesser. But only one of the two Adams, only one of them is willing to stand beside us and call us his co-heir. Only one is willing to stand beside us and call us his co-worker. That takes time. And, and let me, what is a relationship? I mean, we know the chink in the DNA, that's a molecular level, but a relationship takes more time, right? But it's not only just a relationship, it's defined as a marriage. And in this marriage, you have complete intimacy. 
You have complete oneness with Christ. And that requires vulnerability, church. That requires that he give himself to us because guess what? The Christ was always ours to do with what we pleased. The Christ was ours to sacrifice. The Christ was ours to crucify. The Christ was ours to be born. He made himself ours. He made himself a part of this cancerous world. He didn't have to. He could have come and in three chapters. He could have done it all. But he didn't. He didn't because he's giving you a different birthright. Do you feel it? On this Christmas season, do you feel that birthright today? Do you feel that he's made a difference in your life because he was born to you? And being born to Mary, he was born to you today to do with what you will. What are you doing with him? What have you done with him? I invite you to pray with me. Father God, I ask, I ask your mercy on us. We so often forget that you are the most high that you receive the throne of David, that you set all things right in this world. We so often forget that. And I ask that we put you back in your place. And as we lift our hands high to do that, Father, I ask that you show us what it means to be in a marriage with you. You show us what it means that the Christ has come to us as a child born. As a child born to Mary so many years ago, as a child proclaimed by Gabriel, as a child received by Simeon, proclaim it to us today, Father, as the preacher, as the teacher. Proclaim to our hearts what it means for us to wholly and completely have you as you, as we choose to let you wholly and completely have us. Show us what it means to live in this relationship more fully. And by doing so, Father, I ask that we be changed. That this Christmas season truly impacts us. That it's not just about gifts, that it's not just about family even, but it's about the relationship that you started so long ago. It's in your name and by your blood that I can and I do and I always will pray. Now, read Justin.